Good morning, everyone. Welcome to week 12. Um, today is Monday, April 20th. Um, our Zoom session today is between 1 to 3.30 p.m. Um, I'm going to start off with sharing my screen, and we're going to go through some announcements and a check-in real quick. So before we um, start with today's lesson, I wanted to just check in from you guys and have a fun question um, to uh, see how you guys are doing. So I'm going to go through the list of people here. And I'll call on you guys, and I'll give you guys a moment to think about it. Um, if you could have one superpower, what would it be and why? Uh, my children ask me this question a lot. <laughs> Probably like once a week they ask me this question. Um, my answer is I would like to fly um, because I like to travel, and that way I could fly whenever I want. So that would be my superpower. So I'm going to go through and call on some people. How about let's start off with Garrett. Are you there? I'm here. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, well, flight is a good one. My other one would want to be like, if not flight, then um, like traveling through time. Wow. Not necessarily like controlling it and not necessarily physical being it. Just I think watching like time-lapse videos of like Pangea or something would be really cool or like going back and watching you know the ancient Egyptians like building the pyramids and like watching that kind of stuff and just like reliving through history but not just like watching it not necessarily like being there would be fun very cool time travel I never thought of that as a superpower <laughs> uh, Melissa Santiago um, maybe speed. That way I could like finish the quicker if I'm ever late somewhere, like I could get there on time. Nice. Never be late, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, Diana. Um, hi, good morning. Good morning. I think I would choose being invisible because you could just do anything you want, listen to people's conversations. Um, you could travel because you can get on the plane without anyone seeing you. So, yeah, <laughs> I'd be invisible. That makes sense. Cool. Um, Erica? Um, probably the ability to, like, read people's minds so I can know what they're thinking. Wow. <laughs> wow. Erica never thought of these before. Um, how about um, Jessica Fuentes? Um, I was thinking uh, to be invisible, I think, like, for the same reasons that the last student said, pretty much do whatever you want and just, you know, mind your own business. But, like, I don't know. Being invisible sounds cool. Wow. A lot of you guys want to listen into conversations, huh? <laughs> um, Erica. Yes. Did you go yet, Erica? Yeah. <laughs> oh, sorry, sorry. I'm, I'm going through my list. I'm, I forgot who already read. Um, Anthony. Um, probably like a health regeneration, like Deadpool, or like reading minds. Cool. Um, Ashley. Good morning. Morning. Um, uh, probably like teleportation, so that way, like, you can go wherever you want, whenever you want. So similar to Garrett. Yeah. Very cool. Um, Sophia. Uh, I would say telepathy. I think it'd be cool to read people's minds. Wow. Personally, I feel I don't want to know what people are thinking, but <laughs> that's cool. Um, how about Ron Ronaldo? I'll say flying. Flying. Yeah, just to see, you know, be on top and see like how the how it looks from up there. Right. Very cool. How about Ruby? Uh to stop time. Stop time? Yeah. I think it'd be cool to like 
where there's times where you don't want to do anything, but you have a lot to do, so you can just stop time for a minute and then, re like, kind of like calm down and then go on to doing what you need to do. Right. Take what happened, Garrett? Oh, I just said just take a nap real quick. Stop yeah. time. <laughs> That's a way, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think there was a movie or there was a TV show, some girl that stopped time, right? Mm, I'm not sure. Uh, the movie click. Oh, yeah, there's, I think there was a movie click. Oh, okay. Um, how about um, Stephanie Herrera? Um, I would say fly because I hate traffic and I hate driving. Nice. Um, and how about Felicita? I want to teleport so I can be anywhere in an instant. Wow, all of you guys like to be places really fast, I noticed. <laughs> um, Melissa Santiago, you already went. Um, Suzette. Uh, I probably want to have telekinesis. It'd be cool to move things in my mind. Mm, tele what? Telekinesis. What is that again? When you move things with your mind. Oh. Hmm. Um, <laughs> Victor, how about you? Victor? Sorry, uh, uh, my mic was muted. Um, I would like electrokinesis. I think it'd be very cool to control electricity. Oh, oh wow. You guys are creative. I've never even thought of these things. Um, Stephanie Garcia, did you go yet? Oh, um, no, I haven't. Okay, go ahead, Stephanie. Uh, I would choose super strength because I always want to like to like lift stuff that is like heavy, you know, have like really like strength powers. Nice. Um, Joseph. Joseph, you there? Joseph, okay, one more try. Joseph, are you there? Joseph? All right, if not Joseph, then Erica. Do you want me to say mine again? <laughs> oh, sorry, Erica, you already went. Um, Victor already went, Stephanie already went. Joseph, are you there? No? I see you on unmute. I just wasn't sure. Um, Jennifer Velasquez. Um, good afternoon. I think Hi. I'll say um, mind reading. Mind reading. Yeah, it'll be kind of cool. Very cool. Have I called on everyone? Did anyone not get a chance to share their superpower wish? Awesome. Alrighty. So let's thank Thank you for sharing. I just thought it would be a fun way of checking in without having to um, go do too deep with you guys, which is something fun and light. Um, so today we're going to go to 1.30 and we're going to talk about quadratics part B. Um, the agenda today, um, normal, we'll do quadratics, 10 minute break. Um, we're going to do some spotlights. I know Jesus, um, Jesus, are you here today? I know he wanted to do it before, but I'm not sure if he shows up. Um, is there, if anyone else wants to do the student spotlight, please let me know. Um, professor, can I do mine today too? Sure, who's, who's speaking right now? Erica. Erica, Erica Acevedo? Yes. Sure, and you're in Math 130, 140? 130. 130, okay, Erica, you'll be up today. Anyone else want to do theirs today? And Erica, have you already sent me your spotlight? Yeah, I sent it through Facebook. Through Facebook. Okay, I'll look it up. Great. Um, group six presentation. I know um, Math 130, Ramsey's group is going to go on Wednesday. How about Math 140? Okay, looks like you guys aren't here, so we'll skip you guys for now. Um, we'll finish quadratics part B at around 3.30 today. Oops. So here's the homework. 
um, for this week. Um, you'll have the quadratics. It was originally due, half of it was originally due on Sunday, but I changed it just to have it all due at, at one time instead of splitting it up. Um, so all of it is due by this Wednesday, and hopefully you guys have done at least seven topics by now. Um, we're going to have an online quiz on quadratics on Thursday. It'll be opened up during that time. And then there will also be a practice exam that will be opened up this weekend, and that'll be due on Sunday night. And that way on Monday, we can go over <clears throat> any questions on the practice exam. Um, if you haven't sent in your student spotlights, do so. Uh, make sure you guys are still doing your DLAs and SLAs. Um, remember, you need to have five done by the end of the semester. Um, one of them is due next week. So just to keep you guys on track, make sure you guys get that done. Um, next week, so looking ahead, next week group seven is presenting. So let me know whether you want to present on Monday or Wednesday. Um, we'll have our confer Zoom same times on Monday and Wednesday. 1 to 3.30 on Monday and 10 to 12.30 on Wednesday. We will have an exam on radicals and quadratics, so on two chapters. Um, I'll talk more about the exam probably on Wednesday to give you more details on that. And the SLA is due next week as well. And again, Garrett's tutoring hours are always available. Um, and the YouTube channel, um, I kind of change it up a little bit. So when you guys go on my YouTube channel here, um, can you guys see the screen by any chance? Can you guys see the YouTube channel? Yeah, we can see it. Okay, great. So I actually organized my YouTube channel so that you can actually look it up by, um, by topics. So here's radicals. Math rocks is all of my videos, so that's why there's 76 of them. These are the confer Zoom questions that we had. And quadratics, is, which is what we're doing today, um, is on here. So here, there's only one video, but that one video consists of, um, so if you go into that one video, um, Course, method, oh, sorry. step one, if you click on here, you can see what times these topics shows up. Like at uh, 41 minutes, 11 seconds, it's at square root method or whatever. So you can look up um, the topics based on the time right there. All right, so the quadratics, um, there were originally 19 topics, but I've actually cut it down to 17 because the last two topics I felt didn't really fit this section very well. So there's 19 topics, um, I'm sorry, 17 topics. So we've, we've learned this, this first part, the quadratics part A is right here. There were four methods to solve quadratic equations. You, we already learned how to factor, so we did that in another section. Um, last week, we learned how to do the square root property. We learned how to do the complete square quadratic formula. So that was seven topics out of, um, out of the 17. And the remaining 10 topics are what we're going to do today. So solving quadratic-like equations, graphing parabolas, and, and solving quadratic inequalities. And if you look at the picture here on the right, um, notice that there's a soccer player kicking a ball. And the, the graph or the um, trajectory that you see that the ball is going in creates what we call a parabola. So a parabola is something that goes up and then goes down or reverse, it could go down and then goes up. Like it looks like a sad face or a parabola could look like a happy face. So when we're solving quadratic equations, um, if you were to graph a quadratic equation, it becomes a parabola. And there's a lot of things in real life that has the shape of a parabola that we study. So again, um, the projectile of a ball creates a parabola. What goes up must come down because we live on planet Earth, right? Um, but let's make this a little bit more serious. Um, this is a satellite or a rocket ship on the bottom. And this is how, um, this is how people who are, um, who are rocket scientists or engineers or even in the army and military, they need this type of mathematics in order to calculate when they build a rocket ship or when they shoot a rocket ship and launch it into the air, um, they know when it, where that missile is gonna land. If they're wanting to aim for an airplane, an enemy airplane, they need to really calculate using quadratics um, where it's gonna hit the airplane or if they're trying to bomb a certain location, 
they need to know where that bomb is going to land. So rocket ships also have a quadratic or per parabolic, parabola is called a parabolic projectile, and they need to know where it lands. So without understanding quadratics, um, they wouldn't be able to calculate um, the correct landing zone. So quadratics are really important because there's a lot of things in real life that create that parab parabolic shape. So one such as a ball and two such as a missile or a rocket ship. So before we go on to the new section, I just want to leave some time for any questions that you guys have on this about this class or about any of the material. Any questions? Um, I finished my S well my DLA last week on Monday, but I don't know if you received it yet. Um, who's speaking right now? Melissa. Melissa. Um, mm -hmm. Melissa Santiago, right? Yeah. Are you in Math One Thirty or what? One Forty. One Thirty. One Thirty. Okay, I'll check after this on my email because mm -hmm. the Math Success Center should have already. Um, they normally send it to me, and once they send it to me, then I mark it down. So mm -hmm. I can look that up after this. Okay, thank you. Uh -huh. uh, I did mine also before the last exam or quiz, and I don't know if you got it. Um, who is this? Uh, Anthony Miranda. Anthony, I think actually I had um, given you credit for it already, from what I recall. Okay. So go ahead and look on Alex to, to see that I've already given you credit. Melissa, that might have been the same too. Have you looked on Alex to see if I gave you credit yet? I looked last week on Friday and nothing showed up, but I could check again today. Yeah, check again, just in case. Yeah, yeah okay. I have credit. I just checked. Okay, yeah, I think I might have already put it in. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Alrighty. So I'm going to stop this share and I'm going to change it over to my, my phone camera so you can see the lecture. All right, so last week we learned about what a quadratic is, um, the difference between a linear equation versus a quadratic equation. Quadratic equations always have an exponent of two in it, and that's what makes it a quadratic. And we learned four methods of solving it. The first method was factoring, which we learned how to do in a previous chapter. And then we learned those three new methods, which is square root property, completing the square, and quadratic formula. So it seems like None of you guys had any questions on that, so I'm going to keep moving forward. So here, square root property. Um, remember, you need to have it in this form, and you take the square root of both sides, and when you do, you put a plus or minus, um, reminding you of the completing the square property. You take the middle term, you divide it by two, and you square it, and you get that magical number. And with that magical number, you add it to both sides. And when you add it to both sides, when you add that magical number to both sides of an equation, you're gonna be able to factor that left-hand side in a way where it'll look like a quantity being squared equals to a number. And once it gets to that, then you could use the square root property to solve it. And then the last thing we learned was the quadratic formula. And we only had a chance to do one problem but it didn't seem like any of you guys had any questions, so I'm just gonna keep moving forward. And the formula was this. And we just need to be really careful about the order of operations when we solve this. And as you saw in one of your homework questions, that sometimes underneath the square root, you're gonna have a negative number underneath the square root. And when you have a negative number underneath the square root, you're gonna have a complex answer, meaning you're gonna have an I in it. So that's why we learned about I beforehand. So today, we're going to continue on with questions number eight and nine in your, in your um, sheet. So number eight here, I wrote it down bigger here. 
This number eight and nine is about solving quadratic like equations. All right, so when we solve quadratic like equations, when we look at this problem here, we notice that it says x to the fourth. Well, x to the fourth is not a quadratic, right? So we're thinking in our mind, we're thinking to ourselves, hmm, x to the fourth? This is not a quadratic. And we know that a quadratic has to be x to the second, right? So when I have, I have no idea why I drew a bow, but when we have x to the fourth, we don't know how to solve for it yet um, because all we know how to do is solve for x to the second. So what we're gonna do is we are going to make it look like a quadratic. So that's why this is called quadratic-like. It's an equation that originally does not look like a quadratic, but we are going to do something so that it does look like a quadratic so that we can, so that we can solve it. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna use substitution. And this is a really, um, a really neat and big idea, substitution in mathematics. Because when you get to um, college algebra as well as calculus, um, you're going to use a lot of substitution. Where when something looks ugly or messy, you can do something to make it look like something simple or something familiar. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to let u, so u is just another variable. I'm just going to substitute the letter u. I'm going to choose the x squared term here, the middle term the middle um, term with the variable and exponent. So I'm gonna let u equal to x squared. And you might be, why would we be doing that? So hold on to your horses. Um, once we let u equal to x squared, I'm gonna replace, I'm gonna replace this, u, this x squared here with a u. So when I do that, notice I'm gonna have negative 36u, because the x squared now becomes a u. So if I replace it, I need to replace everything else as well, right? So here I have plus 35, and then here I have equals to zero, right? So I'm just replacing everything. So this x to the fourth, well, the question is, what is x to the fourth in terms of u? Well, if you notice something, if I squared u, if I squared this, this here, u, if I squared that, then I have to also square the right side. What's the square of x squared? x to the fourth. Great. So if I squared x squared, as you said, it's x to the fourth. So here, u squared is equal to x to the fourth, right? Because that's where I got that. So u squared is equal to x to the fourth. So in instead of x to the fourth, I'm going to end up putting I'm sorry, not x, but I'm going to put, instead of x to the fourth, I'm going to put u squared. So now I have u squared minus 36u plus 35 is equal to zero. And what do you know? This is now a quadratic. Wow, right? We just changed something that was not a quadratic into something that is a quadratic in terms of the letter u whereas before is in terms of the letter X. Now we've changed it to something in terms of the letter U, and now that it's a quadratic, now I can solve for it. Now I can solve for U. So I can solve for U, and I could solve for it using factoring, square root method, completing the square, or quadratic formula. So for me, I would always try um, factoring first because I think factoring hopefully is the easiest one to do. So I'm going to see if I could factor it. So I'm going to say, can I factor this? So if I think about if I could factor this, if I have u squared minus 36u plus 35, um, I have u and u. Two things that give me 35 that adds to 36. Let me see. So 7 and 5 will give me 35. But if I cross multiply, I get 5u and 7u. That's not going to give me 36u. Uh-oh, did it freeze on me? 
No. Okay. Did it freeze? No. no. Is it working? Yes. Yes. Oh, I don't know why my screen is, is frozen for some reason. Okay. Um, anyway, so if I cross multiply, that's not going to work. So seven and five doesn't work. What other numbers might, might work? 35 and one. Great. 35 and one. So if I cross multiply that, I get u and 35u. So one u and 35u, yes. I just need a negative 36u, so I need a negative and a negative. So a negative and a negative will give me the middle term. So here, I just need a negative and a negative. So negative 35 times negative one does give me positive 35. So there I go, I box this answer. I end up getting u squared, I'm sorry, I am getting u minus 35 times u minus one is equal to zero. And now I can solve for this. Okay. Not sure why my other screen just froze, but. <clears throat> All right, so once I do that, why am I not seeing anything? Then once I do that, I'm gonna solve for u. So using the zero product property, I set each factor equal to zero. And I solve for this, I get u is equal to 35 and u is equal to one. Alrighty, so those are my final answers. Is that right? Am I done? Don't you have to check? Yeah, we do need to check, but actually look back at this problem. What are they asking me to solve for? What letter did we first start off with? X. X, right? So since we first started off with X, my answer U is equal to 35 and U equals to one is not done yet because I want to solve for X, not for U. So because I want to solve for X, then we need to, now let's, can you guys see the screen by any chance? Yeah, we can see it. Yeah. yeah. That's strange for my computer. I can't see it at all. That's really strange. Okay. So now let's solve for x. So we know that u is this, but what is x? So what is the relationship between u and x then? How do we get from u to get to x? What do you guys think? Don't you have to, um, well, like since u equals x squared, can't you like, you know, like the squared thing, like the yeah. radical, I forgot the word. <laughs> Right, so great, since u equals to x squared, we're gonna substitute the u in for here and solve for x squared, right? So you're exactly right. We need to go back to the relationship between u and x squared because remember, letting u equal to x squared is just a temporary fix, right? It's a temporary thing for something that started off so ugly, right? Something that started off pretty ugly because we don't know what x to the fourth is or we don't know how to solve for x to the fourth we temporarily made a substitution. It's like having a substitute teacher, right? Your teacher is not available or too complicated. So you have a substitute teacher right now to come in to make it look more simple. But then in the end, you gotta go back to your original teacher, right? You gotta go back to the original problem. So the substitute is now, thank you very much, u equals to x squared. Thank you so much for substituting. Now let's go back to the original. So since u is equal to x squared, then we have u is equal to 35. So if I have 35 is equal to x squared, right? Because I have u equals to 35 as an answer. I also have u is equal to one as an answer. So I have two, two scenarios here. I have this scenario and I have the other scenario where one is equal to x squared. Because a u, I replace it with a one. The u, I replace it with a 35. So now that I have that, I can solve for x here. So how do I solve for x? Plug it in. Don't you uh, square, don't you do a radical sign on the x squared? Right, right. We're gonna square root both sides, right? So what we learned on last week, if you have x squared equal to a number, you can square root both sides. And when you square root both sides, you need to put a plus or minus, right? So therefore, x, the square root of x squared is just x, is equal to plus or minus square root of 35. 
Can I simplify square root of 35? No. No. So therefore, that's one of my answers. This one, if I square root both sides, what do I end up getting? Uh, one, don't you? Is it one? Uh, square root one, right? The radical. Right. The square root of one is one, right? Plus or minus? Plus or minus. Ding, ding, ding. We need a plus or minus. Great. So these are going to be our four answers. The reason why I say four is because there's a plus and a minus and a plus and a minus. So on Alex, because they don't allow you to write it out as pluses and minuses, you can write it out as your answer is going to be x is equal to square root of 35, negative square root of 35, 1, and negative 1. How many answers are there? Four. Four. What's the highest power? Four. 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 Right. So notice, and when it was x squared, then the highest power is two. You have two answers. When the highest power is four, then you have four answers. So that's. So if it's, so if it's x to the fifth, will there be five power? I mean, five answers? Exactly. Yes. Okay. Yes. So let me give you an opportunity right now to go ahead on work and work on on a problem. So let's do this. I'm going to have you try. So go ahead and copy this problem down. And the problem is this. X to the fourth minus 20 x squared plus 64 equals to zero. So copy that down. And in a bit, I'm gonna put you guys in a breakout room with Garrett. Garrett, are you there? Garrett? Yeah, I'm Garrett? Yep, okay. I'm here. Great, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, we have quite a bit more people right now. Um, 4, 8, 12, 16. Okay, we have a, quite a bit of people in this. We have 22 people right now. So I'm going to split this up into two rooms. Um, go ahead and work on it, and then, I'll, and then you guys can talk to your separate rooms. And I'll put us back together in a second. All righty, everyone. Welcome back. And Garrett, I forgot to make you a co-host, so I'm just doing it right now for you. Yeah, I or different break like um <laughs> sorry now you're co-host so you could jump around rooms now great so i was in break breakout room one and a breakout room two um i'm gonna have diana um share what she did um and oops, that one. and as diana shares what she does i'm gonna write out um write out her work so diana you you have the mic Oh, can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Okay. So um, I solved using substitution. So then I used t and I got t to the second minus 20t. Okay, so you let t equals to x squared, right? That middle one? Yeah. Okay, so when you did that, you get t to the second well, minus... I mean minus 20t. 20t. Plus 64. Plus 64. Is equal to zero. Okay, before you go on, um, notice that Diana used the letter T instead of the letter U, and that's A-OK, -okay, right? So it's up to you whether you want to use U or T. I like to use the letter U because I like the letter U, but it doesn't matter at all. So you can use any letter. So since T equals to X squared, if you square T, you get X to the fourth. And that's why this x to the fourth became t squared. Great. So this is the substitution step. Okay. All right. Go on, Diana. So I don't know. The way I did it is really weird. I hope you can understand. Okay. So I substitute back, and I I got t equals four and sixteen. 
And how did you get four and 16? Because like if you add those two, you get 20. I don't know. It's... Okay. So we're going to solve for T. <laughs> You're on my track. Don't be nervous. You're right. Okay. <laughs> because I've, I've never like solved the problem in front of the whole class. No worries. You guys can see the, the screen, right? Your paper is just cutting off a little bit. Oh, it is? Yeah, from the left-hand side, but that's, we can see it still. Can you see it now? Yeah. yeah. Okay, great. So we're gonna solve for T, and how we solve for T is we're gonna factor, because it's quadratic now, now we can use factoring. So Diana, when you factored it, what did you get when you factored it? So then after that, I solved the equations and I got x to the second equals four and x to the second equals 16, which is like the same thing as I got on the top. And that's where um, I told you I got my answers, which is plus or minus two and plus or minus four. Okay. Got it. Um, I'm going to slow us down a little bit. So when you solve for T, basically you have to factor it, right? So when you mm -hmm. factor it, you get T minus 16 times T minus 4. Is everyone okay with that step of factoring? Yes. Xbox? Okay. And then once you do that, then you do the ZPP. And once you use the ZPP, that's where Diana got T is equal to 16 and T is equal to 4, right? And then I heard you say, Diana, that um, the step after that is now you, um, you solve for x mm -hmm. by using t is equal to x squared. Yeah. So t is equal to x squared here, we get, end up getting that 16 is equal to x squared, and then here, four is equal to x squared, because that's what t is. t is four, and t is 16. And how did you get, what did you end up doing with this? Diana, can you explain that again? Where? What did you end up doing after this part? So then after the substituting with um, the t's, I, I just solved the equations, and then I got uh, four and 16, which is what I got at the top. Right. So we square root both sides, mm -hmm. right? We square root both sides to get x is equal to four, plus or minus four. Mm -hmm. And you square root both sides and you get x is equal to two. Yeah. Right. And notice there's four answers. So actually technically on Alex, you're gonna write x is equal to four, negative four, two, and negative two. Yeah. It's like, both groups, group, group one and group two, both got this. Group three, were you able to get this? I think I was in group three and they, a couple of them got it, yeah. Okay, great. Does anyone have any questions with this problem? All right, thank you, Diana, for walking us through that. Mm -hmm. um, now let's go ahead and look at another problem like this but let's make it look a little bit more complicated. So let's look at example number nine. All right, and let me know if it ever gets cut off from the screen, because sometimes on my screen it looks different from what you guys see. So can you guys see that problem there? Yes. Yeah, it looks good. Okay, and yeah, Garrett, let me know if things get cut off, okay? <laughs> I can't tell when I look at my screen versus what you guys are looking at. Yeah. All right. Thank you. So same, pro so same thing here. I notice I have x minus 5 root x plus 6. But I'm like, OK, this is not a quadratic. So again, this is not a quadratic. Because a quadratic always has x squared as the highest exponent. So because it's not a quadratic, I'm going to use um, substitution. I'm going to use substitution to see if I can make it look like a quadratic. So this is what's going on in my brain. Do, 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 do. So I have this problem here, and I look at the middle term, and the middle term is root x. So I'm gonna say, let's u equal to root x. I always use a middle term 
with the, um, the variable. Let u equals to root x. So if I let u equal to root x, then the question is, if I squared this, if I squared this top and I squared this, what's the square of square root of x? Yeah. yeah, x, right? If I squared this, I'm just going to get x because the square root of x squared is just x. And what do you know? This is x. So here, when I use substitution, this now, this x now becomes, this x now becomes u squared minus 5 and this root x, well, that root x now becomes a u. And then plus 6 is equal to 0, okay? So this is the plus 6 here, and this is the 0 here. So I'm just creating a new equation with the letter u. And again, this is the substitute, right? This is not the permanent fix. This is just a substitute. Now, this is a quadratic because the highest exponent is 2. So, same story. Let's go ahead and solve for it. So, again, I like to factor because factoring, I think, is the easiest one. So, let's see if I factor this at 3 and 2, give me 6. If I cross multiply, I get 2u and 3u, but I want a negative. So, I'm going to have a negative 3 and a negative 2 there. Because negative 3 times negative 2 will give me positive 6. Negative 2u minus 3u will give me a negative 5u. So that works. I'm going to box up my answer. And again, I'm, I'm kind of zooming through the factoring piece because I'm hoping by now that you guys are, um, are comfortable with factoring. So I end up getting u minus 3 times u minus 2 is equal to 0. So ZPP, zero product property, set each one equal to 0. So I end up getting u is equal to 3 and u is equal to 2. Am I done? You have to plug it back in and check. Great. Now I need to plug it back in to the relationship between u and x because we want to solve for x, not for u. So remember, u is just a substitute, right? So in a way, I could almost put this in parentheses because this is just a substitution, right? So now we get back to the original problem. So back to the OG problem. We want to solve for x. So just because we have u doesn't mean we're done. We want to solve for x. So back to the original problem. We know that the relationship between the two is u is equal to square root of x. So that was a substitution. So since we know that u is 3 and u is 2, I'm going to have that 3 equals to root x and 2 is equal to root x. Is everyone okay with that? So I plug the 3 in for u and I plug the 2 in for u. So I have two equations. I need to solve for x. How do I solve for x? How do I get rid of a square root? You put it to um, the second power, right? Great, great. Felicitha says that we basically square, square both sides, right? So Felicitha says, um, raise it to the second power, mean I'm gonna square both sides because the square root of x squared will just give me x. That's how you get rid of a radical, remember? You square it. And whatever you do one side, you have to do to the other side. So this will give me nine. Here, I'm going to square both sides as well to get rid of the x, or just get, get rid of the radical. I get x is equal to 4. And that gives me my final answer. X is equal to 4. I have a question about the factoring part. When you did the negative 3 and negative 2, could you also do negative 6 and 1? Or no? Good question. So is that Felicita? Yes, yeah. Okay, so Felicita is asking me, can we, could we have used negative 6 and 1? So if I use u, u, negative 6, and negative 1, is that what you're saying? No, uh, the 1 is positive. 
Okay, negative six and positive one. Right, because negative six times one will give me a. Uh, well, the problem with this is if you just multiply, you do get u minus six u, which will give you negative five u, which is correct. However, a negative six times a positive one will give you a negative six. Oh, okay. Positive six. Okay, I see. Really good question, Felicita, because, um, yeah, sometimes you get numbers that give you the middle term, but then the signs don't match up for the third term. So that's why that doesn't work. Great question. Uh, so what, what's the answer again? What would be the answer? The answer in the end is x equals to 4 and x equals to 9. Okay, thank you. Okay, Anthony? Yeah. Alrighty. So um, let me go ahead and give you another you try problem. So let's have you guys try this problem. So you try this one. 3x to the 2 third plus x to the 1 third minus 2 is equal to 0. So go ahead and copy that down. And in a second, I'm gonna put us into breakout rooms again. And this time, Garrett, you can jump from room to room. Alrighty, so I had, um, so we were, I was in breakout room number two and um, group two was struggling with this problem. So I'm gonna, I told them let's, let's struggle with it together. So I picked on Ronaldo. Thanks, Ronaldo. Um, we're going to struggle through this together. So uh, let's see. So, Ronaldo, what did we first talk about? What did we let u equal to? Uh, x over one third. Great. So we picked the middle term. Great. And Ronaldo said let u equals x to the one third. So we're going to have to square this, right? Because remember, we want to replace um, u with a u squared. If we squared both sides, if we squared this and we squared this, x to the one third to the second power, so we square both sides, what does this become? x over two, two thirds. Right, x to the two third, right? So here u squared is equal to x to the two third. Because one third times two, we're using the power rule one third times two gives you two thirds. You're multiplying the two fractions, gives you two thirds. And that makes me happy because guess what? X to the two third is right here. Yay. So here, let's go ahead and replace it. So three X to the two third, Ronaldo, keep going. What does three X to the two third become? It will be three to the, uh, three U to the second power. Great, three U to the second power. Plus u. Right, because that becomes u. Good. Minus 2 equals 0. Perfect. Does anyone have any questions so far with this? That was the hardest part of the problem. All right, let's keep going, Ronaldo. What should I do next? Then you're going to factor out. You're going to use the x method. Okay. On one side, it's going to be 3u and u. Okay. And the other one is going to be 1 and 2. All right, let's try that. Uh, Does that work? Two. No, it's going to be the other way. Yeah, two. okay. So we switch it the other way, we get two and one. So we cross multiply, what do we get? Two. Three U and two. Plus two U. So what do I need to make it a 1u? 3u minus 2 and u plus 1. Right. We need a minus 2, right? Yeah. So here, the 2 will become a minus. Right. All righty. And I heard you, Anthony, so thanks for pitching in. All right, so Ronaldo, keep going. So when we factor this, what does this become? It will be 3u minus 2. Uh-huh. And it will be u plus 1. Great. Now what? And then you're going to make each other equals to zero. You're going to solve for u. Okay. So 
using the zero product property, I said mm -hmm. e each of the factors equal to zero in a solve for u. So what does this become? U comes over, uh, u comes two over third. Mm -hmm. And then the other one comes, so uh, u equals one. One? Yes. Try again. I mean, negative one. Yes, thank you. All righty. Are we done with this problem? Is this the answer? No. No. What are we supposed to do next? You gotta plug it in on the first part that we did. Great. So I put this in parentheses just to remind myself that this was just a substitution, right? This is just substitution. And now we want to solve for x. So when I solve for x, we know that u is equal to x to the one third. So let's go ahead and plug things in. So what do I get when I plug things in, Renato? You get two over thirds equals x over one third. All right. And the other one will get negative one equals x to over x to the power of one third. Great. Okay. So we have two options, right? Or two paths here. Alrighty. So now that we have this, I want x to be sitting by itself. How do I get rid of a one third? Can anyone help Renato or if Renato knows? Vertical cube. Okay. So this is a cube root, right? So uh. we could change this to a cube root. I heard Anthony say. Okay, how do you get rid of a cube root? Uh, uh, don't you do the exponent to the third? Mm -hmm. You could cube, well, you could raise this to the third. If you raise this to the third, you also have to raise this, this to the third. And technically speaking, so Anthony, you're absolutely right. You raise it to the third, or you actually didn't have to change it to a radical. You could have kept it here and just rate, multiply this by three raise this to the third and raise this to the third. So same thing. Because here, if you did one third times three, one third times three would just give you one, right? One third times three is one. Or, so you get x to the first power. Or if you did cube root of x to the third power, that the threes will uh, cancel itself out and you end up just getting x sitting by itself. So just letting you know, you could have kept it this way and just raise it to the third or change it to a radical and raise it to the third. It's the same idea. Is everyone okay with getting rid of the one third by multiplying it by three? So what does the left side become? What's two third to the third eight, power? Eight over 27. Eight over 27, right? That's my birthday. That's your birthday, August 27th? <laughs> what do you know? Okay, so let's go ahead and do this part then. How do we get rid of the one third? Px raise to the third power. Right, raise it to the third power, good. So the right side just becomes x, and what does the left, left side become? Base has negative one. Negative one. Ta-da! So this becomes your final answer. So your answer is that x is equal to 8 over 27 and also negative 1. Nice job, Ronaldo. We did it together. Good, try. Good job. Does anyone have any questions on this? Uh, so you wouldn't convert the eight over twenty-seven back to two thirds. To this, nope. Because you wanted to, to do because to get rid of the radical or the exponent, you had to cube both sides. So in order to cube both sides, a two third now becomes eight over twenty-seven. You can't uh, simplify that anymore. Yeah. And this wouldn't be plus or minus eight over twenty-seven. Great question. No, because the only mm -hmm. time that you do plus or minus is when you're square rooting both sides. Oh, okay. All right. So great questions, Anthony. I'm glad you're remembering things from the past. Um, but notice that we're um, raising it to the third power on both sides. When you're raising something to the third power, 
then you don't have to put plus or minus. The only time you put plus or minus is when you're doing the square root property, when you're square rooting both sides. Any questions on this? Any questions from anyone? Alrighty, so let's go ahead and go on to the next topic. So those were only two questions. And of course, um, to really understand it, make sure you do your Alex homework. And you can bet that this is going to show up on your quiz and on your exam, uh, the quadratic like equations. Now let's go ahead and talk about parabolas. So parabolas is the graph of a quadratic equation. So parabolas is what happens when you graph quadratic equations. So parabolas. So I mentioned earlier in this, um, in this video that when you draw, so ax squared plus bx plus c is equal to zero, right? That's the standard form of a quadratic equation. So ax squared plus bx plus c, where a, b, and c are just numbers. Um, and then there's an x squared, x, and a number here. So when you draw this, um, notice, remember when we did a line, it would just look like this or like this, right? A line just looks like that. It's just a line, right? It has slopes in it. But a parabola is either going to look like a happy face or a sad face most of the time. And sometimes, depending on the problems, maybe when you get later a little bit more advanced, it might look from left or right as well. But most of the time, we're going to have it look like one of these two. So this one, this is when we say that, notice parabolas. For me, it looks like a happy face or a sad face, right? Happy and sad. It looks like a, a, a happy smile and a sad smile. So when it's happy, we say that this is pointing upward. And when it's sad, we say that it's pointing downward. Other things to know about a parabola is that this points, so notice it's going down, 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 then it goes up, up, up. It's going up, 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 then at this point, it goes down, down, down. Same thing with this, it's going left, and then change its direction, goes right. It is going right, then changes direction, then it goes left. So where the parabola changes direction is where we call the vertex. So this is called the vertex. So the vertex is the point in which the parabola changes direction. And where I say it happens at the hump, right? The hump of where the parabola is at. So the vertex is always made up of a point. It's a point, so it's going to be an x and a y value, right? It's going to be some x value and a y value. Vertex is always a point on a graph. So at the vertex right here, if you drew a line in the middle of the, that cuts through the parabola right here, so here's my dotted line. So if I drew a line that goes through the vertex, this is what we call the axis of symmetry. That line that cuts through the vertex is the axis of symmetry. So put on your thinking cap for a second. And remember when I told you before that I love mathematics because the name of that the name of things actually describes what it is. Why do you think it's called the axis of symmetry? Can you move your paper to the left a bit? Oh sure. Is that better? No, the, the other way. Sorry. Oh, the other way. Sure. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. So why is it called? The axis of symmetry. Anyone know? Well, an axis is a line, right? 
And symmetry is, notice where I cut, if I was to, to cut this in half, notice that the left side is an exact mirror image of the right side. So this axis of symmetry right here, the left side is the exact mirror image of the right side. Same thing with here, through the axis of symmetry, the top portion is, if I fold, if I fold this paper in half, the top portion is the exact reflection of the bottom portion. And that's why it's called symmetry, it's symmetrical. Symmetrical means that they're the same on both sides, right? The same on both sides. So let's take a look at number 10 on your worksheet. So look at number 10 here. Here's a parabola. And the question is, does a parabola open upward or downward? Um, Jessica, help me out. Do you think this is upward or downward? Upward. Upward, right? Does it, do you guys agree with Jessica? Yes. All right, so I'm gonna skip part B for a second. Let's look at part C. So let's look at part C. Um, Joseph, help me out here. It's asking you, what is the vertex? So looking at this graph, where do you see the vertex? It consists of an X and a Y value. Okay, I see Joseph, um, he private messaged me. I guess you don't have um, you don't have sound right now, huh, Joseph? He put four comma negative one, and that is correct, Joseph. So four comma negative one. So if you go to the right four and down one, that is the vertex. Great job. All right, and then here it says find the equation of the axis of symmetry. So the axis of symmetry goes right through. Right there, right? That's the axis of symmetry. It cuts right through the vertex. So the axis of symmetry is a line. And here, it's a vertical line. Okay, can anyone tell me what is the equation of this vertical line? This is a blast to the past of what we did a couple chapters ago. What's the equation of a vertical line that goes through four. X equals four. Okay, great. Good job. Great job remembering that. X what? equals four. So this vertical line, no. notice that every single point on this vertical line is that X always equals to four. The X value always equals to four. It's just the Y value called constantly changes, but the X value is always four, any point on there. So this vertical line is x is equal to four. That is the axis of symmetry. Is everyone okay with that? Any questions? All right, and then the next question here is the x-intercept. So the x-intercept is where it crosses, where the graph crosses the x-axis. So again, I love that the name of it, you don't have to memorize, or it's not rocket science of what it means. So the x-intercept is where it crosses the x-axis. So where does this cross the x-axis? Um, Suzette, can you help me out? Where does this cross the x-axis? What, what x value? Uh, two and six. Great. So two and six is where it crosses the x-axis. So we write this as two comma six. And then the y-intercept, again, is where the graph crosses the y-axis. Again, very self-explanatory. Um, Ashley, can you help me out? Where does the, this graph cross the y-axis? Um, sorry, can you repeat it? So what is the y-intercept? Where does this graph cross the y-axis? Uh, sorry, it's because it's small. Can't see. Oh, no worries. It's you should have it in front of you too. I'm not sure if you yeah, have. I'm trying to zoom into it. Okay. Um, Here we go. It would be uh three. Good. Is everyone okay with that? Three. It crosses it at three. So that's where the y intercept. So here the y intercept is three. 
Right. Any questions on this page? All right, so question number 10 is just to help you understand um, what a graph of parabola looks like. Now let's go ahead and go on now with graphing a parabola. So you have one, two, three, four questions on this. Um, actually, before I go into graphing the parabola, let's do question 14 real quick. Um, so question 14 is asking you to find the domain and range. Does anyone remember what a domain is? What is isn't, domain? <laughs> isn't domain the x uh, points? Right, all the x values of a function. And all the, oh, all the x values of a function are, is basically the horizontal window of a graph. So here, this parabola goes like this. So all the x values, so this, notice this arrows, that means that this parabola is gonna keep going, 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 going. And this arrow is gonna keep going, 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 going. So the x values is the horizontal window of this graph. So how big is this horizontal window? So here's what it is on paper. But remember, this graph is gonna keep going, 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 and it's gonna keep spreading itself out wider and wider, this parabola. So this parabola is gonna keep going bigger and bigger and bigger. So what would the domain be of this graph? Would it be infinity, infinity. to negative infinity? Exactly, negative infinity to infinity. So the x values, because it keeps going, 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 it gets getting wider, 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 this parabola, the x values gets wider, wider, wider. So great, good job, Anthony. The domain is gonna be from negative infinity to infinity. And what do I put around it? Do I to, what kind of, do I put parentheses or brackets? Parentheses. Parentheses, right? So around here. Um, that's if they ask you to write it in interval notation, but because they didn't ask you to write interval interval notation, you could just put all reals, all real numbers, right? So on Alex, you could just write all reals. Um, and again, all reals just means from negative infinity to infinity. If they ask you to write it in interval notation, then you want to write it like this. But if they don't, you could just put all reals. So the range then is what do you think range is going to be? Uh, would it range be from one to infinity? Okay, so it's going to be all the y values of a function, right? So it's going to be from the vertical window, right? So Anthony, I heard you say, what did it, what did you say? Uh, from one to infinity. Right. So here, the 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 vertical values or the y values starts at one the y value of one goes all the way to infinity. Nice work. So one to infinity. And one, would you put an open or a closed bracket? Does it go through the number one? Uh, would it be closed? Yeah. Yeah, it's closed, right? Because there's actually a dot right here, right? And then to infinity, infinity is always open bracket. So again, this is if they ask you to write it in interval notation. If they didn't write it, ask you to write it in interval notation, you could write it as y is greater than or equal to one. So in this problem, since they didn't tell you how to write it, um, you could just write as y is greater than or equal to one. And that's the same thing as that. Does anyone have any questions on that, on domain and range of a function? All righty. So let's now go ahead and tackle. And Lakonda, I see your statement. You said that helped. I was struggling with a problem. I didn't understand it. Thanks. You're welcome. I'm glad you're here to join us. So now we're going to talk about questions 11, 12, and 13. And 11, 12, and 13 is asking you to graph a parabola. So how to graph a parabola.
So it, there are two ways. So the first way, so I'll put two ways, and it depends on what the form of the parabola is. This is why, two ways. So the first form, if you look at number 11, it looks like this. The second form, if you look at number 12, looks like that. So depending on the form that they give you, um, it's the easiest thing to do is to know both forms and then be able to graph based on that form. So the first form is this. Um, the first form is if you have form one, if you have an equation that's in the form of, let's start it with the standard form. AX squared plus BX plus C is equal to zero. If you have it in this form, how you draw the parabola is first you want to identify what the vertex is. So I always identify what the vertex is. The vertex is going to be, so remember the vertex is an X value and a Y value, right? It's a point on a graph. Well, to find out the X value, the X value is going to be the formula negative B over 2A. So let's look at this problem here. So I'm going to look at number 12, example 12. So I have y is equal to x squared minus 10x plus 26. What is my a in this problem? So a is a coefficient of x squared. What's my a in this problem? X. Try again. One. So, I'm sorry? One. One, yes. Good, great. So because there's an invisible one here, the coefficient of X squared is just one, great. Good, and what is B in this problem? Negative 10. Negative 10, and what is C? 26. 26. So if you kind of think of the quadratic formula, it's kind of like that, right? AX squared plus BX plus C, right? The coefficients of each one. So the X value for the vertex is negative B over 2A. What's negative B over 2A? Would it be negative 10 over 2 times 1? Okay. All right, what do you guys think? Is it negative 10 over 2 times 1? Yes, and then you would simplify it. So let me stop you guys real quick. What's a little bit off with that? There's something that's a little bit wrong. Would it be positive 10? Yeah. yeah. And why would it be positive 10? It's already a negative B. Yeah. Good. Because it's a negative of the B, so negative of a negative 10, right? So the negative of a negative 10 will actually be a positive 10, right? So be careful of the sign. So what does that equal to then? Five. Five, right. So the x value for the vertex is five. So remember the vertex is that point where the hump of the quadrat of the parabola is. So the x value is five, we need to find a y value as well. Well, how do you think you, we find the y value. So I'm going to let you guys put on your thinking hat right now. If the x value is 5, how do I find out what the y value is? Would you plug it in? Great. Great. Plug it in, plug it in, right? So we want to plug it in. Professor, can you move your, your paper up just a little bit? I can't see what you're writing down. Sure. Uh, move up now. Okay. Is that better? Yeah. Can you see that? Okay. So I'm going to plug in the 5, because we know what x is. I'm going to plug in this 5 into the equation to find out what y is. So plug x equals to 5 into equation. So let's go ahead and plug that in. So I have y is equal to 5 squared minus 10 times 5 plus 26. 
Let me give you a, a second to figure that out. Anyone get an answer? One. Great. Do you guys agree with Anthony? Looks good to me. All right. Looks good. All right. So here the vertex is going to be five comma one because the x value is five and the y value is one. So here the vertex is five comma one. So that's how we start off with graphing a parabola. Five comma one. You for a second? I'm sorry? Can I pause you for a second? Sure, go ahead, Eric. I want to share my screen with you. Can you guys see me? I wanted to point out something with the vertex and like the negative b over 2a. Hold on. You look, Are you, well, let, me, let me spotlight your video real quick. All right, Garrett, you're on. If you look at the quadratic formula, right, notice this is a fraction with just addition and subtraction, so we can split that. And if you notice this first term, doesn't that look awfully familiar? That's the vertex. And kind of what this is saying is from the vertex, we go to the right some distance and we go to the left some distance. So if you look at it, right, here's our vertex. We go to the right some distance and we go to the left some distance. Mm. And so if you can remember the quadratic formula, then you can remember the vertex with just the first part of it, the negative b over 2a. I like that. I like that, Garrett. Can you show, put, put it up again? Right. So that's a great way of deriving or explaining how we get the vertex, right? It was based on the quadratic formula. Perfect. Thank you. Thanks, Garrett. All righty. So now that we know that the, what the vertex is, um, let's go ahead and let's try graphing it. So here in this problem, question number 12, we know we found out that the vertex is 5, comma one. So I'm going to go five to the right and up one. So this is five comma one, right? Oops, five plus one. Five and positive one. That's the vertex. Okay, that does not look like a parabola. It just looks like a dot. And that's because we're not done yet. So the other thing to know is, so from the vertex, um, one thing to know is if you have it in this form, this a in the beginning, if a is greater than zero, meaning it's positive, then you're going to have a happy face, parabola. If a is negative, if a is less than zero, if it's a negative number, well, just think of positive people are always happy and negative people are always sad, right? That's how I remember it. So if a is negative, the shape of your parabola is going to be sad face. So in this problem, since a is equal to one, a is positive, I know right away that my, my, or my parabola is gonna look like a happy face. So I already know the shape of my parabola. So in my mind, once I do the vertex, I already know that the shape of my parabola should look like a happy face. The question is, okay, if it looks like a happy face, is it gonna be a wide happy face or is it gonna be a narrow happy face? How wide or narrow is this happy face? Well, the only way to find out how wide or narrow is this happy face, so I'll put how wide or narrow is the happy face? So, whoops. How wide or narrow is the happy face? So I know it starts here in the vertex, and it's gonna look like a happy face. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to plug points. I'm gonna plug points to the plug points left of the vertex. And then I'm gonna plug points to the right of the vertex. So on Alex, they're gonna ask you when you graph it to not only put the vertex, but also plug in two points to the left and two points to the right. So here, if my, I'm at five positive one. So my X value here is five, right? 
my x value is five. So let's pick two points to the left of five. So I'd like to just pick the points right next to it. Say four and three, right? I'm gonna pick four and three. To, I'm sorry, to the left of five. And then I pick two points to the right of five. So I think, well, what's after five? Well, six and seven. So I plug two points to the left of the vertex and two points to the right of the vertex. And then I find out its y value. Is everyone okay so far? All right, so if I plug points to the left of the vertex four, how do I find out what the y value is gonna be? So would it be uh, two points to the right and five points to the left of the vertex? Right, so we, we, I just picked it one point to the left and another point to the left. And then one point to the right and then another point to the right. So since we started at five, the vertex, the x value of five, I went four and three, and then six and seven. Is that okay, Anthony? Yeah. Okay, so to find out what the y value is going to be, okay, I hear Joe, I see Joseph. Um, and by the way, Joseph, you can message the whole group, not just me, so everyone can see what you're writing as well. Joseph wrote down, because he can't, he doesn't have audio right now, he says plug four into the equation to find y. Great, so let's go ahead and plug four into this equation. So if I plug four in here, let's see what we get. So go ahead and... Yell it out once you find out what, what happens when you plug in four. Two. Two, you guys agree? Yeah. Okay, now go ahead and plug in three. Anyone get anything? Five. Five. Five, do you guys agree? Sounds good. All right, sounds good. So four, I'm gonna plot this in a four, two is a point on the graph. So four, two is right here. Three, five is a point in the graph. So here's three and then here's five. So here, and I only need two extra points to, to connect my dots to draw my parabola. Now let's go ahead and plug in points six and seven into the graph into the equation. So plug six and seven into this equation and let me know what you guys get when you plug six and seven. Six and two. Try again. Oh yeah, yeah, oh, I, I, I see. I think that's six and two here. Yes, yeah, six comma two. Seven, five. Seven, five. Great, great job guys. So here I have six comma two and seven comma five, right there. Six comma two and seven, oops, some, so when I connect the dot, it looks like that. So notice something that because this is a vertex, the left side is symmetrical to the right side. So that's right when you put four two, this is six two. 3, 5, and this is 7, 5. So the y values are exactly the same as the y values on the other side of the vertex. So again, if you moved one to the left and or one to the right, the y values should be exactly the same. From the vertex, if you move two to the left or you move two to the right, the y values are exactly the same. And that's why it's called the axis of symmetry. If you end up doing something where you get different answers where they're not symmetrical, then either you did the math wrong of plugging it in or you chose the wrong vertex. So if you don't have the right vertex, you're not gonna have a symmetrical situation like that. And notice this is a happy face. If I end up putting dots where it doesn't even look like a happy face, I know I did something wrong. All right, so that's the question for number 12 here. So again, the first thing you do in summary is the first thing you do is since it's in standard form the first thing you do is you want to find out what the vertex is and negative b over 2a as garrett mentioned from the quadratic formula negative b over 2a is the x value and then you can find the y value by plugging in the x value into the equation once you know what the vertex is 
You could also find out whether it's a happy or sad face just looking at the equation to see if A is positive or negative. Once you find out the vertex, then you could plot two points to the left and two points to the right of the vertex, and your Y value should end up being symmetrical so that you could draw your parabola accordingly. So in the end, you should have five polka dots or five dots in your graph to draw your parabola. Does anyone have any questions with that? All right, so let's go ahead. Um, um, notice on number 13. So I'm not going to do number 13, but I want you to notice the questions on it. So notice the questions. The question on number 13, so this is a different problem here. So pretend we graphed it. But the question says, does the function have a minimum or a maximum value? Where does the minimum or maximum value occur? What is the function's minimum or maximum value? So I'm going to apply those questions to this problem we just did. So this problem that we just did here, so let me just pull up those questions on another sheet so you can see it side by side. When a question asks you, does a function have a minimum or maximum value, notice that the vertex or the hump occurs where the graph is the lowest. So because this occurs where the graph is lowest, you would say that this is the minimum value. So this graph here has a minimum value. So it has a minimum, meaning a smallest value, because the hump occurred when it's going downwards, right? When this left side is going downwards and then it goes up. This occurs at the lowest point on the graph, so that's called a minimum value. Whereas if you had a graph that looks like a happy face, oh, I'm sorry, that's the same thing. If I had a graph that looked like a sad face, does this graph have a minimum or a maximum value? Maximum. So, yeah, right. So at the highest point, this is called the maximum value. So for those of you that are going to go into calculus, this is really important um, as well, um, because at the minimum and maximum value, a lot happens. So if you're shooting a rocket ship, the maximum value is where the rocket ship hits, hits the airplane, right? Or if you're trying to bomb something or whatnot, the, the minimum value is where it hits the ground, right? So the minimum value is where the vertex is, and the maximum value is also where the vertex is, depending on the shape of the graph. And then so the would, the, would the minimum or the maximum value always be the vertex? Yes, yes. The minimum or maximum value is always the vertex. Great, great question. Good observation. Yes, good observation. So the minimum or maximum value is always the vertex. And what's the minimum or maximum based on what kind of shape the parabola is. And then the next question says, what is the min function's minimum or maximum value? So when they're asking you what is the function's minimum or maximum value, they're asking for the y value of the vertex. So that's what they're asking you for. What is the y value of the vertex? Because it's what is the minimum, maximum, or, or the function's minimum or maximum value? So here in this problem, what is the minimum value of this parabola. So notice the vertex is five comma one. So when they ask you what is the function's value, minimum or maximum value, it's the y value. So the y value here is one. So you would answer that question as this is one. And then when it asks you, where does the minimum or maximum value occur? This is going to be the x value of the vertex. So where does the minimum or maximum value occur? Well, it happened at x equals to 5. So where it occurred, does it happen x equals to 5? What is the value of it? It's at y equals to 1. So that's for this graph. Um, this problem here on your worksheet for question number 13, it's for another graph, so you're going to have to graph it before you answer that question. But again, I just want you to know how to answer this question based on another problem that we did. 
Does anyone have any questions so far? All right, last but not least, I'm gonna do one more problem and then I'm gonna give us a break. So the last problem here is graphing a parabola in this form. So I mentioned that this was form one. Form one is when it's in its standard form, ax squared plus bx plus c. But form two is when it's in that form. So form two here, is when it's in the form y is equal to a times x minus h squared plus k. So that's the form that you need to memorize for a parabola. And where h and k, where a, h, and k are numbers. Okay, same story with the previous form. If you, your A is, if A is positive, you're gonna have a happy face. If A is negative, you can have a sad face. Again, because positive people smile and sad people frown, right? So here in this problem, what is my A in this problem? Would it be one? Good. A is one, right? So in this problem here, this is problem number 11. Y is equal to X plus one squared plus three. Here in this problem, my A is this invisible one right there. So since A is one, that means A is positive. Therefore, I know my quadratic is gonna be happy or sad face? Happy. Happy face, right. So I know the shape of my graph. Now we need to find the vertex. So to find the vertex, in this form, the vertex is always going to be H comma K. Whoops. So my vertex is always gonna be hk. So here, here, it's gonna be h comma k. So I like to think of it as Hong Kong, <laughs> hk Hong Kong, vertex is Hong Kong. So notice it's, there's a negative h and there's a k here. So basically what you're gonna do is when you look at your equation, if you see a positive one here, you're gonna change it to its opposite. So here, the, pos the vertex is going to be the opposite. So Hong is here, Kong is here. So you're basically going to think of it as the opposite of H and then the same as K. So here, if I have positive one, the opposite of positive one is going to be negative one. And then Kong is the one outside the parentheses. It's just going to be the same sign, three. So the Hong, you always take the opposite of the one inside the parentheses, and then Kong is the same thing. So X minus H, so that's negative one comma three is a vertex. Um, just a quick, um, quick um, exercise real quick. What is the vertex for this one then? Let me do this so you guys can see. This is a different problem. I want you to see this. What is the vertex? Negative four. one, negative one. I'm sorry, say again? Negative four, negative one. Negative four and negative one. Great, do you guys agree? Yes. Yeah, because Hong Kong, but you take the opposite of the one in the parentheses, so positive four becomes negative four, and then Kong stays the same to give you negative one. Great, okay, just wanted to make sure you guys understood how to apply Hong Kong. All right, let's go back to our original problem here. So here in this one, we know that the vertex is negative one, three. So negative one, three is right here. So here's my vertex. And I know it's gonna be a happy face. But again, I wanna know, is it gonna be skinny or, or narrow? I mean, is it gonna be narrow or wide? So I'm gonna plug in points into 
two points to the left and two points to the right of the vertex. So the vertex, what's the x value of the vertex? Negative one. Negative one. So what are two points to the left of negative one? Negative two, negative three. Great. And what are two points to the right of negative one? Uh, zero and one. Zero and one. Go ahead and plug in these points into here, and hopefully these y values will match up with these y values. So let me give you a chance to do that. All right, did anyone get an answer for these? Did I rush you guys too much? Negative two, four. Negative two, four. And then negative three, seven. Negative three, seven. Great. Do you guys agree? Okay. How about a zero and one? Zero, four. Zero, four, and? One, seven. One, seven. All righty. So let's, any questions on that? Was that Ruby or who was that? Yeah, it was me. Okay, thank you, Ruby. Mm -hmm. So let's take a look at what Ruby did. So she plugged in negative two in here and negative three, she got this. Plugged in zero and one, she got that. And again, the left side looks just like the right side, so that's good. So let's see if this, these polka dots that I put in will look like a happy face. So I get at negative two, I put in four. And at negative three, I plug in seven. Same thing with zero, or I'm sorry, zero, I have four. And at one, I have seven. And then I connect the dots and I draw arrows at the end to represent that it goes on and on forever. Does that look like a happy face? Yes. It sure does. Great. So nice work, gang. So now we know how to graph a parabola um, using uh, two forms, I have this a form and the other form. Yes, go ahead, Anthony. So can't you tell that the... Uh, the parabola will start at three from the beginning since it's plus three. Since so that it starts at, what do you mean that starts at three? Yeah, like it'll start uh, on the on the y-axis, like it'll be three. Um, oh, like that it'll the crop that y-intercept will be three. Yeah. Um, actually not because if you look at here, it actually crossed the y-axis at four. Oh, okay. Yeah, so yeah, the three does not represent, it's not the y equals to mx plus b form. It's not the line. Yeah, so if it was a line, then it would be a three, but this is a parabola, so it doesn't follow the same, the same um, formula as the line. Okay. Yeah, good question. Yeah, because across the- If the parabola it, was in standard form, your idea would be correct, but here we're not in standard form. Oh. Alrighty, so great questions. So again, um, two forms, standard form. Know that the vertex is negative b over 2a. Plug it in to find the y value. Plug in two points to the left, plug in two points to the right. Same story with form two. It's already in this form, so all you have to do is find out what, it's Hong, what Hong Kong is, what the vertex is. Plug in two points to the left and two points to the right. All right, great job, you guys. Um, I'm going to give us a, um, a seven-minute break, so let's come back at 3.05. And we'll do the student spotlights after this. All righty. Welcome back from the break, everyone. I know it was kind of short-lived. Um, I just... I'm really big on wanting to make sure we um, end on time to honor everyone's time here. Um, I'm going to have Erica. Um, Erica, are you still there? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, great. Erica volunteered to do her um, presentation or her student spotlights. So I'm going to share screen so that she can speak. And Erica, do you mind that I record this or would you rather me not? Oh, you can record it. That's fine. Okay. And you are on, my dear. Okay. Hi, class. My name is Erica. And um, this is my student spotlight. And on... Well, I have my dogs on the upper, I'm not sure if it's up the right. Um, I have my dogs, they mean a lot to me. Um, one of them is called Stella, another one is called Ruby. 
Um, on the bottom of that, I have a picture of a stethoscope and it's in the shape of a heart because I'm trying to major in nursing. So that's my major. Um, next to that, I have a picture of the pike because I just, I love the pike. I'm always there <laughs> due to this coronavirus. Currently not there since we're not allowed to be out. And um, yeah, I really like going there. Me and my friends are always there. And then next to that, I have a picture of my dog. <laughs> I'm really into art. I like drawing. I love painting. And that's one of the pictures I did in high school. Wow. Um, next to that, I have a picture of me and my friends. Um, they mean a lot to me, too. We usually go to Universal every year, kind of like our tradition. And on top of that, we I have a picture of my nails because I love getting my nails done. Mm -hmm. um, I just, I don't know, makes me feel good about myself. And next to that, I have a picture of a roller coaster. It's called Tatsu. It's in Six Flags. And it's one of my favorite rides. I just love roller coasters in general. So yeah, that's it. Which one are you on the right-hand side with those three girls? Uh, Not the one with the orange. Next. Next to the one in white. Oh, this one on the left? Yeah. <laughs> there you are. You're so small. I'm like, wait a minute. Which one is you? <laughs> and then that's Katya. She's also in the class. <laughs> oh, oh, who else? I'm sorry. That's Katya. Oh, she's in this class. Okay, cool. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, any questions or comments for Erica? Are those schnauzers or type of terrier? Uh, those are miniature schnauzers, yeah. Yeah. I love their little beards. Yeah, <laughs> we have to trim them down like every few every few months because then they get too long. Oh, yeah, they'll have like bushy beards and super bushy eyebrows. <laughs> yeah, we have to like trim them down <laughs> or then they can't see. <laughs> So how long it took you to draw that? Um, I think it took me about like a month. I can't really remember. But it's all freehanded. I did it all freehanded. That looks cool. Thank you. Yeah, it looks very intricate. It's amazing, the details. What's your favorite thing to do at the Pike? Uh, well, me and my friends, we usually just walk around. I don't know, it's just little things here and there. <laughs> are you, um, are you dying because you can't get your nails done right now? <laughs> I'm just wondering. Yes, I am. <laughs> <laughs> they don't, I don't feel normal. <laughs> <laughs> right, everyone's like, open up the salons. <laughs> and you're, it sounds like you're in a great, uh, you have a great career path because the medical field and nursing, as you can tell, it's always in need, so. Yeah, that's kind of why I really want to be a nurse. <laughs> just, it's always in need. I, always, I just want to help people. Awesome. Any other questions or comments? I like the patterns of the, the art. Oh, thank you. All right, very symmetrical. Get it? <laughs> you just learned about symmetry. Anyways, thank you so much, Erica, for sharing. All right, it's always so nice to hear a little bit more about you guys, um, to know who's in the class, and who knows, you guys might be able to build some connections with other people in the class that, you know, that can last for longer than this, cl this class time. Hey, you're the only math professor I've had that does that, and I like it. Oh. I know, me too. I like that you make jokes all the time. It really makes the class so much more fun. It's not just boring <laughs> math all the time. <laughs> yeah, she's, yeah, it's funny. Hong and they're Kong. funny jokes, right? They're not just <laughs> corny jokes, right? Yeah, definitely. It's like, um, they're kind of like, uh, for like kids, but that's the fun part, is that it's for kids, so you could just go back to like, back in time when you were a kid too, and just laugh. <laughs> yeah, I... Fortunately or unfortunately, my humor has been really kind of like um, kiddish humor. I like play on words and, you know, some people have like really sexual or, or inappropriate jokes and I've just never gone there. I just do some corny jokes. Yeah, that's the awesome part. <laughs> I'm glad you appreciate it, Paloma. You get an A in the class, okay? Oh, no, I, I know I got to work for it. <laughs> Alrighty, well, thank you, you guys. Um, without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and... Um, switch to my phone so we could move on to the last topic for in the next um, the next uh, 18 minutes. So the last topic is on solving quadratic inequalities. 
So we've learned how to solve quadratic equations, and now it's gonna be about inequalities. So again, inequalities, remember, are when we have less than, less than equal to, or greater than, or greater than or equal to, right? Those are inequalities. Well, there are steps for doing this as well. So again, I really like steps because with steps, you kind of know where to go. And um, once you get good at it, then you could jump steps. But once you're just learning how to do it, then you want to make sure that you go through each, each step without skipping anything. So here, let's take a look at question number question number um, I'm going to jump uh, directly to question number 16 so number 16 here can you guys see that okay again let me know if I you can't see what's on the camera I have x squared minus 10 x is greater than negative 24. So the first thing you're going to do is you are going to first pretend that it's an equation. So temporarily make it like it's an equation. So step one, temporarily, temporarily pretend it's an equation. So temporarily pretend that it's an equation. And when I say pretend it's an equation, let's see what would happen if you pretended that this was an equation. You would get x squared minus 10x is equal to negative 24. Well, the question is, well, how do you solve this if it was an equation? I notice it's the highest power is 2, so I know it's a quadratic, right? So I'm going to try factoring it. So remember, so here I'm going to try factoring. So I notice that it's a quadratic equation. So I'm going to try to factor. So let's see if that works. So to try to factor it, I set it equal to 0. So x squared minus 10x. I add 24 on the other side so that it equals to 0. So again, I hope this is not new to you guys, that this is something that we've seen over and over again, right? You have a quadratic equation, you set it equal to zero. Let's try to factor it. So if I factor it, two things that give me x, or x squared or x and x, two things that give me 24 are um, six and four. If I cross multiply, I get four x and six x. And to get negative 10 x, I can put a negative here to get negative 10 x. So therefore, I need a negative on both the negative six, on both the six and the four. And negative six times negative four does give me 24. So that works. So as a result, I end up getting x minus six times x minus four is equal to zero. Okay. And after that, I set each factor equal to zero. So I get x is equal to 6 and x is equal to 4. Okay. okay, does anyone have any questions on solving a quadratic equation? So step one is a review of what we've done before. So here we've solved for x, but notice that that is not the point of this problem. The point of this problem is what is x squared minus 10x greater than negative 24? So step one is to pretend it's an equation. So solve for x. So pretend it's an equation, so solve for x. And that's what we just did. So these are what we call boundary points. Or um, yeah, I'm going to call them critical points or boundary points. Um, I'll call them boundary points. And in, some in a calculus language, we call it critical points. 
So you can call it whichever one you want. I think in calculus, it's called critical points. Um, here in, al in algebra, I'll just call it boundary points, but they mean the same thing. So these are what we call boundary points. So when we solve for x, we are finding the boundary points. So notice that if I plug 6 or 4 into this equation, if I plug 6 or 4 into this equation, it'll set the equation equal to 0. But because this is an inequality, we're not trying to find it when it equals to 0. So what I'm going to do next is step 2. I'm going to use the boundary points Use the boundary points. And how I use the boundary points is I'm going to create a number line. Create a number line and plot those points. So here, so here I'm going to create create an number line and plot the, the those points. So I'm going to draw a line. And we said that the boundary points that we got from step one was four and six. So four and six, I'm going to write them in, in its correct order, four here and six here. And notice my original problem is x squared minus 10x minus 24. So x squared minus 10x is greater than negative 24, I'm sorry. That was my original problem, right? So I'm just gonna bring this over to the other side, x squared minus 10x plus 24, I added the 24 to the other side is greater than zero. So we are actually trying to find the x's that I could plug into this value in which I, the answer will always be greater than zero. So if I plug x equals to four in here, it's gonna equal to zero. If I plug six in here, it's gonna equal to zero. So I'm not trying to find the answers that creates an equal to zero. I'm trying to find the answers that makes it greater than zero. So therefore, outside of the boundary points, I'm going to check the numbers to the left of four, between four and six, and after six. I'm going to plug in test points in between these boundary points to find out whether those numbers will create a positive answer or a negative answer when I plug it into this inequality. So let's go ahead and test points. So step two was um, create a number line and plot those points. So I'm going to write that in step two. Create a number line and plot the boundary points. And step three, Step three is going to be test points surrounding the boundary points. So I'm going to test points surrounding the boundary points because we know that at the boundary points, the equation is going to equal to zero. The inequality will equal to zero, but we don't want it to be equal to zero. We want to see what is greater than zero. So I'm going to test points. So step three. is test points around the boundary points. I'm going to put BP for short. Test points around the boundary points. So I'm going to test, let's see. Let's try x is equal to, let's try something less than 4. So I'm going to pick a really easy number. I'm going to pick 0. You could pick 3. But I'm going to pick 0 just because 0 is easier to plug in. So a number to the left of 4, if I plug 0, into this equation, do I get a positive or a negative answer? So if I plug zero on here, I get zero minus 10 times zero is just zero. So zero minus zero is just zero plus 24. So my answer is just a plus 24. So I'm going to get a positive answer. So any number that I plug in less than four is always going to give me a positive answer. So you could try plugging in one or two or three. If you plug in those numbers, you should always get a positive number. Let's go ahead and plug in a number between 4 and 6. So between 4 and 6, let's plug in the number x is equal to 5. 
So when I plug 5 in here, 5 squared minus 10 times 5 plus 24, do we get a positive or a negative answer? And again, I'm just going to use my calculator. So I'm going to plug in 5 squared. Oops. 5 squared minus 10 times 5 plus 24. I end up getting negative 1. So I know that when I plug in a number between 4 and 6, I get a negative. Now I'm going to plug in a number after 6. So I'm going to choose the number 7. So x is equal to 7. When I plug in 7 into this inequality, I get 7 squared minus 10 times 7 plus 24, I end up getting positive 3. So any number after 6, I get a positive answer. So you could try putting an 8, 9, 10, any number to the right, you'll always get a positive answer. So here we've tested the points around the boundary point. So we know that any number that's less than 4, you get positive. Between 4 and 6, you'll get negative. And after 6, you'll get positive. And at 4 and 6, you will get 0 if you plug 4 and 6 into this equation. So the last step then, now that we know the behavior of the numbers around these boundary points, step 4 is to answer the question. So answering the question then, x squared minus 10x plus 24, the question is asking us what when, what are the x's that'll make that possible? Well, when, what, sorry, what x's or what values will make this quadratic, um, quadratic inequality greater than zero? Well, greater than zero means positive. What, what numbers will make this positive? Well, here's the positive and here's the positive. So here, my answer, and actually let me check to see if they want it in. Um, they say, graph the solution to the following inequality. So they want it to be graphed, and sometimes they ask you to um, write it in interval notation. So I'll do both of them so that you can see both types of answers. So they say to graph the answer. So the answer is gonna be this. It's gonna be, um, Here's four and here's six. The answer is gonna be everything on the left side of four and everything on the right side of four will give you positive answers. So positive answers, the left side and the right side of four and six will give you positive. And the question is, do I do an open circle or a closed circle? Well, notice that this is greater than. If they had a greater than or equal to, I would do closed circles because it would include it when all the numbers that makes this equal to zero. But since this is strictly greater, there's no equal sign, then I'm just gonna say the open circle on four and six because it does not include four and six because four and six would make this equal to zero and we don't want it to be equal to zero. We just want it strictly greater than zero. So that would be the answer to the question by graphing it. If they ask you to do it in, in it, write it in interval notation, in interval notation, the answer would be everything from here to here. So it's gonna be this window. So it'll be everything from negative infinity to four, open bracket because it does not include four, union, this window, everything from here to here, which is six to infinity, open bracket, open bracket, because it does not include six. So let me summarize this. So this will be the answer, whether they ask you to graph it or write it in interval notation. So number four would be to answer the question. So whether that means graph or interval notation. So the four steps for solving inequalities, the first step is should be pretty easy by now because you pretend it's an equation and you just solve for x. So you use factoring or completing the square method or quadratic formula, whatever method, try factoring first, it's the easiest. Once you pretend it's an equation, you solve for your x and you'll end up getting what we call boundary points. 
With those boundary points, you're going to create a number line and plot the boundary points. After you plot the boundary points on the number line, you're going to test the points surrounding it to see whether you get positive or negative answers. And then the last step is depending on whether you want positive answers or whether you want negative answers, you answer the question depending on what they're asking you and either in graph or interval notation form. Alrighty, so that was number 16. Um, there's number 17 as well, which is a little bit of a harder problem. Um, I don't have time for that, but if you guys need me to go over that, let me know. Um, I, I can stay after a few minutes to solve this as well, but I just want to honor the time. It's 3.28 right now. So if any of you guys need to leave, I just want to thank you guys for coming. Hold on one second. Let me change this. All right. So if any of you guys need to leave at this time, it's 3.30. I want to honor that time, feel free to do so. I'm gonna stay and stick around for another 10, 15 minutes or so. And for those of you guys that want me to do number 17, I can um, do it right now as well. I'll also record it, so if you need to leave early, you can watch it on Confer Zoom. But in the last two, three minutes, does anyone have any questions or comments? I have a question. Yes. Um, are you gonna update the homework um, instead of 19 topics? Are you gonna put 17 topics? Yes, I already changed it. It's, um, I made the change right before class, so it's 17 topics on both classes right now. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. If we did the last two topics, would we still get credit? Um, no, sorry. Those last two topics are gonna be topics for the next section, so kind of think of it as you studied ahead of time. Oh, okay. Yeah. Sorry about that. Any other questions? Okay, if not, um, just want to say goodbye to those guys that need to leave. Thank you for joining us. I'll see you on Wednesday. I'm going to go ahead and do question 17 right now. Um, it's solving for a quadratic rational inequality. It's a little bit harder, but I'll go ahead and do that. And again, um, I'll record it. And if any of you guys need to see it later, uh, feel free to watch the Zoom, confer Zoom recorded session. Let me know if you guys have any questions. Feel free to speak up. Uh, can I see the sub number four, um, the notation for number? Sure. So sub number four, um, the answer right here, you mean? Yeah, there you go. Okay. To draw the. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. So example number 17. We're going to go through the same steps as well. However, it's a little bit harder because there's um, an, a, a little nuance to it. X plus 5 over X minus 4 is less than or equal to 0. So step 1, I'm going to pretend it's an equation. So I'm going to say x plus 5 over x minus 4 is equal to 0, and I'm going to say solve for x. Okay, it's pretend it's an equation. So if this was an equation, what would make a fraction equal to 0? Uh, don't you multiply it um, by, uh, by itself? I mean, to itself? Um, not quite. Uh, like uh, 5 times 4 and then five, uh, 4 times 5? Like you flip uh, it? So it would be um, times 4 over 5 instead of 5 over 4? Or no? Um, not quite. So let us try this again. But thanks for, for trying. What makes the fraction equal to zero? So if I gave you, um, what's, um, if I had give you zero over seven, what's zero divided by seven? Uh, zero, isn't it? Zero. What's zero divided by eight? Zero. What's zero divided by x? Zero. Right. 
So the key thing is what makes a fraction equal to zero? The key thing is that when the numerator equals to zero, then the fraction equals to zero. When the numerator equals to zero, then the entire fraction equals to zero. So that's a, so this is just a reminder part. This is just a review of um, a concept about mathematics of fractions is that whenever something equals to zero, that means that the numerator has to equal to zero in order to have the fraction equal to zero. So since this fraction equals to zero, I'm gonna set the numerator equal to zero. So to solve for x, I set the, set the numerator equal to zero. Can you guys see that? Yes. So to solve for x, set the numerator equal to zero. So here in this case, oops. So here in this case, the numerator is x plus five. So I'm gonna set, x plus five equal to zero. So what is x equal to? Negative five. Right, negative five. So x must equal to negative five because negative five plus five equals to zero. So that is one of the boundary points. So um, this is, and then now the next part here is where it gets a little bit different um, in that boundary points is where the equation equals to zero, but boundary points is also where the equation does not exist. So here, the key, one different or new thing is that boundary points for an inequality occurs where the inequality equals to zero or where the rational does not exist. So irrational remembers a fraction. So boundary points for an inequality occurs where the inequality equals to zero. So that's what we just did. When does this inequality equal to zero? Well, when the numerator equals to zero or where the rational does not exist. So again, a rational is, um, irrational is a fraction. So where the rational does not exist, where does this rational not exist? Where does a fraction become undefined in other words? And it says zero in denominator. Exactly. Good job. So good. So good job reminding that. Remembering that when the when there's a zero in the denominator. So when there's a zero in the denominator. So where the rational does not exist. That happens when there is a zero, when the denominator is zero. So where the rational does not exist is when the denominator is zero. So here in this case, when does the denominator equal to zero? So here I'll write it on the side here. X minus four, when is the denominator equal to zero? When the numerator equals to zero? Mm, try again. When does the denominator equal to zero is when does X minus four equal to zero? So I just wrote it here. So when does the denominator x minus four equal to zero? Positive four. Yeah, when x is equal to four. So x is equal to four is another boundary point. Right. So this boundary point occurred when the rational equals to zero, and this boundary point occurred where the rational does not exist. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So in other words, when you get a rational, set the numerator equal to zero and solve for it. 
When you have a denominator, set the denominator equal to zero and solve for it. And that's kind of the shorthand cliff note of what I did, but I just was explaining uh, why I was doing that. So the bounding points occur where the numerator equals to zero and where the denominator equals to zero, where it does not exist. All right, so that's step one. So after step one here, let me get more paper. After step one, now I'm going to do step two, which is, which is to draw the number line, right? So when I draw the number line and I plot my boundary points, well, my boundary points are four and negative five. So negative five goes first and then four is right here. That's step two. Step three is I'm going to test points. So I'm gonna have test points left, middle, and right. And I'm gonna plug it into this inequality here. X plus five, X plus five over X minus four. I'm gonna plug it in. So I'm gonna test the points. So first I'm gonna to try to plug a point to the left of negative five. So let's try X is equal to negative six. If I plug negative six into this inequality, do I get a positive or a negative answer? So negative six plus five will give me, negative six plus five will give me negative one over negative six minus four will give me negative 10. A negative over negative will give me a positive. So I'm gonna put positive here. I'm gonna pick a number between negative five and four. What's an easy number to plug in? 5.5. 5. 5.5. 5. 5. Try again, what's a really, really easy number between two. negative five and four? Two, easier than two. Oh, sure. Uh, zero. Zero, yeah. Let's try to plug in zero. So a number between negative and five, where I just try to work, um, just work smarter, not harder, right? Try not to do, try not to make your life hard, but try to pick the easiest number, right? If I plug in the number zero in here, what do I end up getting? Zero. I'm sorry? Five over negative four. Five over negative four, and that, gives, that means it's a negative number, right? So between negative five and four, whatever number you plug in here will always give you a negative. So you could have plugged in negative four, negative three, negative two, positive one, two, three. If you plugged any number in here, you would have gotten a negative. I just happened to pick the easiest number zero to plug in. So let's plug in a number after four. What number do you guys want to plug in? Five. All right. So let's plug in five in here and see what you guys get. 10 over one. Okay. 10 over one, so that's a positive number. So here's a positive number. So now we know the behavior of numbers for this inequality. If you plug in numbers to the left of negative five, you're gonna get positive answers. Between negative five and four, you're gonna get negative answers. After four, you're gonna get positive answers. So the last step now is to answer the question. So the question asks us to write the answer in interval notation. So I'm gonna first figure out, well, what is the answer on the graph, okay? So in the graph, my answer is anything that's less than or equal to zero. So do I want positive or negative answers? When it's just less than or equal to zero, is that positive or negative answers that we want? No, negative. negative. Yeah, negative, right? Less than equal to zero means negative answers. So we want the negative answers. So again, we want the negative. So the negative answers are gonna be between negative five and four. Right? So if I, they asked me to graph it, I would have said, okay, between here and here. And then I need to figure out if, whether they're open or closed circles, right? So notice that this is, less than or equal to. So it's okay for this inequality 
to equal to zero. So at negative five, notice if we remember in this problem, when we plugged in negative five in here, the boundary point negative five, if you plug negative five into this problem, you get a zero in the numerator, which will make the equation equal to zero. So therefore, negative five, do we do an open or closed circle? Close. close. And why close? I just, I the either. sign has a little equal to or, or greater. Right. Because it's less than or equal to, right? So it's okay for a number negative, such as negative five, if we plug negative five in here, you're going to get a zero in the numerator. And a zero in the numerator will just create a zero in, as an answer. So that's okay because it's less than or equal to. Right, good job. How about four? Do I do an open or close bracket on the number four? What do you guys think? Closed as well. Okay, so we think maybe it's closed since it's a less than or equal to, right? Since we see less than or equal to, we say, oh, okay, then let's close all of these boundary points. However, this is a little bit tricky. What happens at the number four? What happens if you plug four into this equation or in this inequality? So it would be equal to zero, wouldn't it? So, but the denominator can be zero, right? Right. So if you put four in the denominator, you get four minus four, which is zero. And I think I heard someone say that you can't have a zero in the denominator. So remember this four here, was a boundary point where the inequality does not exist because you cannot have a zero in the denominator. So the problem with the number four, if you put four in here, it does not equal to zero. If you put four in here, you get undefined. So therefore you can't put a four in here. If you put a four in here, you get undefined, which doesn't work. So I'm gonna do an open circle on that. It's a really tricky problem, so. It's understandable that this is a little bit harder to understand. Again, the boundary point negative five is a closed circle because the inequality says less than or equal to zero. And at negative five, if you plug it in, you get zero in the numerator, which a zero in the numerator creates a zero as a fraction and as an answer. If you plug four, four's open circle, it does not include four because if you plug four into this fraction, you get a zero in the denominator, and a zero in the denominator creates undefined. It doesn't create equal to zero, it creates undefined, which is not what we want. Does anyone have questions with that? It's kind of tricky. So they ask us to write it as interval notation. So interval notation then is between here and here. So negative five comma four, and what kind of, do I do open bracket or close bracket for negative five? Close. Close, right? It includes negative five. How about four? Open. open. Right, because it's an open circle. And that is our answer. Does anyone have any questions on this? So again, it's a kind of a tricky problem. I just want to go over the steps again. Step one, solve for x. And to find the boundary points, we set the numerator equal to zero and the denominator equal to zero and solve for x. And that's where we've got x equals to negative five and x equals to four. Step two is to create a number line with the boundary points. Step three is to test the points around the boundary points to see if you get positive or negative answers. Step four, the final answer is to answer the question. So since they want less than or equal to zero, we want the less than, the part that creates a negative answer. And then we need to make sure we look at less than or equal to and see which ones would be open or closed brackets. So that's where it gets a little bit trickier than other problems. All right. Oh, Sophia, I see your answers on, on the group chat. 
Oh, by the way, for those of you guys that are trying, I know Sophia and, um, and Joseph had a hard time um, um, speaking through the mic. What you could do is that you could sign on with your, your, your laptop or whatever, and then you could call in with a phone to have access so that you could talk and hear what people are saying through the phone. So you could kind of dial up through the computer and the phone so you could have audio option as well. All right, and are they going to be graphing um, inequality functions or just the like number line ones? Just the number line ones for now. Are they going to be doing the 2D ones eventually? Mm, I don't remember the top of my head. Okay, I was just curious. Okay. Because remember how I showed you about the like the mountain and always doing it above? Oh yeah, that's right. The that's same right. thing applies for these guys too. Oh, okay. If it comes up, let me know and feel free to jump in and... and yeah, no, I will. I will. <laughs> All right. Have a good anyone, one. Anyone else have any questions? If not, I'll end the meeting soon. I had a question about the SLA. Yes. I had texted you through Messenger. 